Matthew chapter 22 is where we're going to be today. I would encourage you and invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 22 in your Bible with me. Matthew chapter 22, turn in your Bible. If you need a Bible, we have Bibles in the back in our next step area. We'd love for you to take one of those Bibles, open it, take it home, read it, uh, open it up daily, dig into that word of God and ask him to speak truth and, and then to live out the truth, amen? Matthew chapter 22. We're going to close this teaching series today titled Short Stories. We've been looking over the past seven weeks uh, at uh, these parables of Jesus. And each parable points to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus teaches us that. That each parable points to the kingdom of heaven. And, and so as you're finding Matthew chapter 22, many have asked, are we participating in any disaster relief recovery efforts? And the answer is yes. Yes, we are. We had a team uh, thankfully, a last-minute team assembled yesterday morning, and we were able to go and to be a blessing to a, uh, a widow in our community. Um, and, uh, and she had the biggest tree I've ever seen in my life. Uh, the picture, I was like, all right, we can get this. And then, the, then we got there, and it's like, wow, that's a lot bigger than the picture, you know? Uh, <laughs> you, you ever been there? And uh, <laughs> so that's why you never quote jobs, like, without seeing them. And so, uh, and so um, but I'm thankful for those that gathered, because I do believe that we were... Uh, both a blessing and a testimony, both a blessing and a testimony. And so I praise God for that opportunity. As uh, many of you know, I serve as director of Treasure Coast Baptist Association. And so on, um, on Saturday uh, morning, Audra uh, and I drove up to one of our Haitian churches in Vero Beach. There's 68 churches that are part of Treasure Coast Baptist Association. And that church was flooded, uh, uh, had some standing water, and we had a disaster relief team uh, on Friday get in there and then come back Saturday uh, and so uh, we were there, um, excuse me, we were there Friday. We were there Friday to see it, uh, roof leak. And so we're able to partner as an association uh, and to help this church. Uh, they're meeting by the grace of God here today, uh, well, there today, um, and uh, in that building. And so we're able to get the water out, shockwave it, uh, spray the shockwave, and, uh, and then come back, clean it, and then look at the roof. And so I'm working with a roofing contractor to help them. And so uh, thankful to be able, that that was the only associational church that had damage. Uh, so, so thankful for that. We, uh, we will be uh, deploying teams to uh, Sarasota. We'll be deploying teams to Sarasota. And if you're interested in serving uh, with the Disaster Relief Ministries of the Florida Baptist Convention uh, in partnership with Treasure Coast Baptist Association, uh, then let me know. There's also a slide that's been going. I've, I've seen it a couple times already today that goes through the loop. And so there's a slide where you can click on uh, more information to volunteer uh, or to give. People have asked, where do you give? I would just encourage you, be wise where you give. Everybody's taking money. Isn't it amazing something comes through and, every, oh, everybody's taking money now. It's like, wh who are you, you know? They just, they just created that nonprofit yesterday. Uh, and so they'll gladly take your money. And so just be wise, be a good steward of what God has entrusted to you. Give to uh, um, um, uh, legit, uh, legitimate works. And uh, one of those would be Treasure Coast Baptist Association. I can answer questions after this worship gathering if you have those questions uh, to give. But uh, we've already deployed teams to Perry uh, following Hurricane Helene. And they were there serving people. And people... Uh, came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior in the midst of the uh, uh, aftermath of that storm. We praise God. And I can't, I can't wait. I can't wait to see, uh, hear the reports of those that will come to know Jesus right here in St. Lucie County, throughout the Treasure Coast, uh, in other parts of Florida, uh, for the glory of God, uh, following, fo following the tornadoes and, and Hurricane Milton. And so what an opportunity. I say all that to say, what an opportunity to be alive. And what an opportunity for the church to rise up, to go and to tell. What an opportunity for us to be a witness of the Lord Jesus. If you're a guest with us today, uh, I would encourage you to take that connect card that you were handed on the way in and to begin to fill it out. Uh, if you'd rather fill out a digital connect card, you can scan the seat back in front of you. If you're online with us, there's a link in the comment section. You can click that link. It, it, it's linked to our digital connect card. And we want to be able to connect with you. We want to connect you into this community of faith and all that the Lord is doing through his local church. And uh, so we don't know how to connect with you if you don't tell us how to connect with you. And so would you connect with us? So a lot of connections. Uh, can we say connect one more time? Connect. Tell the person next to you, connect. And uh, that was a joke. Uh, but um, 
Also on the Connect card for the final time, there's an area for prayer, and uh, we would love to come alongside of you and pray for you and with you. Uh, we meet every Wednesday at 8.30. You are invited to come and join us to pray. It is, uh, it is not a Bible study. It's certainly not a gossip session. It's a time that we can come together and pray. And so 8.30 every Wednesday, 8.30 in the morning right here we meet. And I would uh, encourage you to come and pray with us. And we lift up these requests. We lift up the requests of our community. And uh, what a wonderful time to, to gather uh, with the church and, and pray. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. We're looking at this, this final parable in this teaching series. And it's the wedding banquet. It's the wedding feast. And uh, as we take a step back, just to, to look at the text, I believe what we will see is Jesus himself prophesying about the gospel and even to the end times. Jesus is going to give us a glimpse of what it will look like after he comes back. Jesus is coming back, amen? amen. He's coming back for his bride. He's coming back for the church. And so Jesus in this parable is giving a glimpse of what it will look like after he comes back and gathers us around this table. Man, what a day that's going to be. Jesus continues to explain to the religious leaders within the context of this section of Scripture, Matthew 21, Matthew 22, He's explaining to the religious leaders of the day and also the listening crowds the danger of rejecting him. The danger of rejecting him. And so, Matthew chapter 22. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables. Jesus spoke to them in parables. The kingdom of heaven is like... Now, each of these parables is about the kingdom of of heaven. We cannot miss that. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. A king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who gives this wedding banquet or this wedding feast for his, his son. Now, before we get to the wedding feast, I want to help us understand a little bit of the culture of the time. Jesus is teaching in ways that the people would understand and relate to their culture. And so in ancient Jewish weddings, there's three parts. There's three parts to the ancient Jewish weddings. The first part is known as a mutual commitment. A mutual commitment. You can try and pronounce the Hebrew word however you want to try and pronounce the Hebrew word, but the Hebrew word means mutual commitment. It's part one of the ancient Jewish weddings. In ancient times, the father of the groom often selected a bride. The father of the groom often selected a bride for his son. Traditionally, in preparation for the betrothal ceremony, the bride and groom are separately immersed in water in a ritual called the mikvah, which is symbolic of spiritual cleansing. And so part one was this mutual commitment. In preparation of this wedding, in preparation of this wedding, the bride and the groom would step into the Jewish mikvah, where they would be fully immersed in water. Again, the Jewish wedding is very descriptive of our lives in Christ Jesus. What happens when you and I step into the waters of baptism? Well, a couple things take place. One, it's a beautiful picture for those that have stepped into the waters of baptism. It's a beautiful picture of what the Lord Jesus has accomplished for you and for me and for the world. That Jesus would walk on this earth. That he would be crucified on a cross, as you 
stand in that upright or sit in that upright position. That Jesus would be buried in a borrowed tomb, but Jesus wouldn't stay under that, buried in that borrowed tomb. Amen? You're thankful that the pastor didn't hold you in longer, right? Uh, or, or the discipler. And, and so then you're brought up out of that water, and it represents that Jesus is alive. And so it's a beautiful picture of the gospel as you and I step into the waters of baptism. And, but then it's also a picture of, of what Jesus has accomplished for you. Hey, we need a reminder that I was born a sinner and that what Jesus offers is to make me white as snow. Forgive me of all my sins. That's what Jesus has accomplished. And so this first part of this mutual commitment, this first part of an ancient Jewish wedding is representative of what Christ Jesus has done for you and for me and what he offers a lost and dying world. The second uh, part is the engagement. It's the engagement. After the immersion, the couple entered the hupa. The hupa, it's a fun word, the hupa. We can say that word in Hebrew. Uh, uh, the hupa, it's a marriage canopy, symbolic of a new household that you are no longer part of the old household, the old creation. You are part of a new household, a new creation uh, to establish a binding contract. The groom would give the bride money or a, or a valuable object to seal the covenant vows. Don't miss this. That Jesus paid a high price, his precious blood, the high price, for your salvation and my salvation. And so in this ancient Jewish wedding, part two, as a part of the engagement, there was a price to be paid. Although they were considered married at this time, they did not live together or engage in sexual relations. During this time period, during this part, the groom was to prepare a place for his bride. Don't miss this. While the bride focused on her personal preparations. That is her wedding garment, and that is keeping the lamp lit. Although the bride knew to expect her groom after about a year, she did not know the exact day nor hour. The groom could come at any time. It was the father of the groom who gave final approval for him to return to collect his bride. The bride kept her oil lamps ready at all times, just in case the groom came in the middle of the night. Sounding the shofar, the ram's horn, to lead the bridal procession to the home he had prepared for her. If you're new to church, new to the faith, new to the Bible, there's some great pictures here, descriptions here. You and I are referred to, the church is referred to as the bride. We're the bride. We're awaiting the return of the groom. Jesus, our Savior, is coming back. John 14, 3, Jesus said this, if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. That's an assurance. That's a promise. Hold on to it. The Messiah, as the bridegroom, has gone to prepare a place for us the day of the return of the Messiah for his bride, I believe, is soon approaching, and the question is, are you ready? Are you ready for Jesus to come back? Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10, would you write that reference down, says this, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. That's the shofar, <laughs> a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. And so in this part two of ancient Jewish weddings, we find this engagement 
period. But so much is happening. So much preparation is happening. And don't miss that the bride, you and I that are in Christ Jesus, there's a call throughout the New Testament to stay alert, to be sober-minded, to be, have a clear conscience. That there, there's, there's work in this time period for you and I to be his witness, to be his witness that that lamp would keep on burning. The bride, the church, you and I that are in Christ Jesus should live holy lives, keeping ourselves pure in preparation for the great wedding feast of the Lamb when the groom comes with the blast of the shofar to bring his bride home. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says this, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. The third part of the ancient Jewish weddings was the marriage. And with this marriage, it was a fanfare. It was a celebration. There was a lot of noise. The groom carried the bride home. Carried the bride home. The bride and groom would enter through the, the hoopah, or that, that marriage canopy. And, and this is what they would do. They would recite a blessing over the wine, which was symbolic of joy. And they would finalize their vows one to another. Today, as we look at this text in Matthew chapter 22, I believe there is a, a, a main theme. And the main theme is this, that God draws us. The main idea is that God draws us, or, or as it's been said, God invites us in. God draws us. Look back to the main text, Matthew chapter 22. We see in, in verse 3, he sent his servants to summon those invited to the banquets, but they didn't want to come. Again, verse 4, he sent out other servants and said, tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen and, and fattened cattle have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. As we read this, especially if you're new to the church, you're like, what's happening here, right? Well, if you were here last week, do you recall, as we looked at the parable of the vineyard, that the servants were reference of the prophets, and that God used these prophets throughout the Old Testament, these men of God called by God to speak to the people of God, to call the people of God back to God. Return to me. That was the call. Repent of your ways and return to me. We see that the king sends the servants out and that the people didn't want to come. The first group of people didn't want to come. We see that there's a, a, a second group of servants being sent out. A second group of servants being sent out. Don't, don't miss it. Jesus is speaking in ways that perhaps the religious leaders couldn't quite get. But he's speaking, I believe, in prophetic ways. The first group being the prophets who were rejected. The second group could it be that it would be the apostles, those that are walking with Jesus, learning from Jesus, listening for Jesus' instruction, being prepared by Jesus. I mean, in just a, a short while, Jesus would endure great suffering as you continue to read through the Gospel of Matthew. And then after that, he would visit about 500 people in a span of 50 days, and then he would ascend into heaven. But he's been preparing the disciples all along. 
And he tells them, do you recall in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that you will receive power? Before verse 8, though, he says, wait for the Father's promise. And you're going to receive power to be my witness right here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Once you've received that power, that supernatural power, you are going to be scattered. You're going to be sent out to be my witness. What we see in verse 4, I, I don't want to miss anyone, or I, I hope you see this with me, but what we see in verse 4 is God's pattern. God's pattern. It's always been for the Jew first, and then secondly, for the Gentile, anyone that's not Jewish. That's God's pattern. We, we see he sent his servants to call the people of God, the Israel, people of Israel, to himself, come, the party's ready, the banquet's ready, the feast is ready, but they've rejected. Well, then he sends the servants, the, the second round of servants. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, would you write that reference down, Romans 1, 16? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. This is what the apostle Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation. The gospel, the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes first to the Jew and also to the Greek. We see God's pattern, his people, that they would repent of their sins and return to himself. We see the, the first group resisting to come to God. Then the king sends the second group. And what does the king say? Do you notice it in verse 4? Everything is ready. All things are ready is the message of the gospel. Don't miss that. All things are ready is the message of the gospel. You don't come to God's feast and prepare your own meal. Amen? He has made it ready for you. You simply come to receive. He's done all the work. Come and receive. The wedding feast in ancient times would last seven days. Now, I don't, I don't know about your wedding, uh, but, but praise God, all the people around didn't last seven days with Audra and I. Uh, you know, we were kicking them out. We were kicking them out. It's like, it's, it's, it's time, man. It's, it's, it's show time, right? How many of y'all have the sign when you throw a party? It's popular right now. Hey, I'm glad you're here, but leave by 9 p.m., amen? And, uh, and you always got the person that's going to try you, right? You always got a person, did they really mean it? And then uh, you start, like, turning the lights on, and they get the hint, right? <laughs> but, but can you imagine this in ancient times, seven days, what a celebration, full of life, full of music, full of food, full of fellowship, the wedding feast. What a great celebration. Now, Jesus is, I believe he's, again, speaking with prophecy of, what it's, of what's to come. Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19, verse 6 says this, then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters, and like the rumbling of loud thunder saying, hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty reigns. Verse 7, let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has prepared herself. Verse 8, she was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. He also said to me, these words of God are true. What we see in Revelation chapter 19, after Jesus comes back for his church, we're gathered around this table that we don't deserve to be at. It's only because of his grace, his goodness, his mercy that we're able to sit at 
It's only because at one point in your life, you repented of your sins and confessed that Jesus, you are Savior, that you have been saved and sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And at that point, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and you gather. One day, we will gather around this table, this great wedding feast with the Savior, with the King, and we will party. Look to verse 5 of Matthew 22. But they paid no attention and went away. One to his own farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. You see the response? The king has sent, sent his servants out to, to call the people to the banquet. And here's the response. I'm too busy. I got work to do. I got other priorities. I got other pursuits. And beyond that, they start killing the servants. Verse 7. The king was enraged. And he sent out his troops, killed those murderers, and burned their city. Again, we find that the guests resisted. The guests that have been invited to the party resisted. Acts chapter 7, we find uh, the first account of a Christian martyr. Stephen is his name. And Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit, a bold gospel witness, would not back down even in the face of death. Listen to how he speaks to the people of this day. Chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, verse 51, says this. You stiff-necked people. Steve's not holding back. He's like, man, if I'm going down, I'm going down. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are always resisting the Holy Spirit. As your ancestors did, you do also. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They even killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one. That's the Messiah. Whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You received the law under the direction of the angels, and yet you have not kept it. When they heard, verse 54, when they heard these things, they were enraged gnashed their teeth at him. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. He saw the glory of God and Jesus at the right hand of God. He said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They yelled at the top of their voices, covered their ears, and together rushed against him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as you continue reading, what you'll find is this sparked the great wave of persecution that came over the church. And out of a response for the great wave of persecution, in the midst of devastation, in the midst of disaster, in the midst of death, the gospel went forth. The gospel went forth. We see back in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus notes... Uh, that they burned the city down. They killed the servants and they burned the city down. Well, do you know in AD 70 what happened? What happened in Jerusalem? There was a revolt. And the Romans burnt the second temple. And much of Jerusalem was burned to the ground. This happens after Jesus shares the response of those who resist Come to the banquet. Look to verse 8. Then he told his servants, the banquet is ready. But those who were invited were not worthy. Verse 9, go, don't miss this. Go then to where the roads exit the city and invite everyone you find to the banquet. 
So those servants went out on the roads and gathered everyone they found, both evil and good. The wedding banquet was filled with guests, filled with guests. So he told his servants, go and invite. Bring people in. The banquet is ready. He tells them to, to go to the highways. Man, we just sang it. Scream it from the mountains. Tell the masses that he is God. He instructs the, the servants, even if it means death, go and tell. Go and tell. I, I believe the, the same call is for you and I as the church, no matter what we face, to be faithful to go and tell. To be faithful to go and tell. And tell. Look, look at verse 11. When the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there who was not dressed for a wedding. So he, he said to him, friend, how do you get in here without wedding clothes? How do you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Verse 13. Then the king told the attendants, tie him up, hand and foot, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. So the king comes in after the servants are faithful to go and invite. The king comes in and he sees this man. He's not dressed in wedding clothes. You might be thinking, ah, you know, uh, these are the church clothes, <laughs> you know, maybe that I grew up having to wear. And, Jesus isn't talking about church clothes here. He's talking about the righteousness of God. That only those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus for salvation, that have been clothed in righteousness, are allowed to sit at the wedding banquet table. And so this tells of of one who trusts in their own righteousness rather than the righteousness of Jesus. Quickly, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. There's not one perfect person. Everyone born after Adam are born into a sinful nature. What is the glory of God? Well, that's the standard. That's the, 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 the standard which is perfection. And we've all fallen short of that standard of perfection. And so our works are not good enough. We'll never be good enough. It's only the finished work of Jesus that clothes us in righteousness, that forgives us of all of our sins, that reaches that standard and meets that standard of perfection because he is the only perfect one. Verse 24 of Romans 3 says, they are justified freely. You've been justified freely. Listen, by his grace... Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All because of him. Nothing because of me. Verse 25, God presented him as the mercy seat by his blood. By his blood. Through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. We see in verse 14, as Jesus has this one bound and sent away, who's not clothed in the righteousness of God. Jesus says, uh, for many are invited, but few are chosen. Many are invited, but few are chosen. Now, we don't have time today to take you through a seminary course because I've already taken you through an Old Testament survey uh, of ancient wedding traditions. But, but we don't have time today to sit here and debate about election choice, free will, all of these things, important, important truths and principles. And if we're not careful, we can get so caught up in the knowledge that we don't practice the application. And, and I, I, I think uh, 
If we're honest, we have too many churches that are filled with a whole lot of knowledge, but no practical application. So what does all this mean? This means this. There's one who is sovereign over all things, and it is the Lord our God. It's not me, and it's not you. There's one who gave it all so that I could be clothed in righteousness, forgiven of all my sins, have a living hope and a heavenly hope that awaits me. And then lastly, I've been called by God to go and tell, to be his witness. That's our job. That's our calling. The one thing that will not happen in heaven happens here on earth. Spread of the gospel so that people might know. With salvation, it's important to understand that God draws you. And God will use any means to draw you to himself. Consider that, that moment of salvation for you. Consider how the Lord used a person or a circumstance or, 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 or his creation or reading his, the Bible one day. Con consider all the things that the Lord used to draw you to himself. And out of all of it, what an opportunity that God would use someone like me and someone like you to go and tell, to go and and invite others into this marvelous gospel. John 6, verse 44 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. I wonder today, are you, are you ready for the party? Are you ready for this wedding feast? Are you ready for Jesus to come back? And then, then I would then I would also challenge you. Will you invite others to the party? Will you live a life that demonstrates to a lost world that you belong to the Lord? That there is something different about you. That your candle isn't hidden, your light isn't hidden, but is shining bright for the world to see. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? all across this place and, and those that are joining me online. Again, we've talked about it a couple times now already today, but what an opportunity. What an opportunity with all that's transpired this past week for you and I as the church to be found faithful, to go and tell, to invite people in, I wonder if there's someone here today that's that you're you're wrestling with. And have I accepted this invitation? Have I committed my life over to the Lord Jesus? Have I placed all my faith and trust in Him, the finished work of the cross? I wonder just for a moment as as people are praying and just considering what, what is my response, God, from all of this? What's my response? I wonder if there's anyone in the house or anyone online that would say, today, today I, I need to get things right with the Lord. Today I need to surrender over to him as Savior. Today I realize I'm a sinner. Jesus is the Savior. He's the only way to salvation. And right here, right now, I'm going to place my faith and trust in him. If the Spirit of God is stirring in your heart, He's drawing you today. Hey, don't delay. Don't delay. Would you cry out to Him right where you're at, wherever it might be? Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. You are the Savior. I repent of my sins. I trust you for, for the salvation of my soul. Here's my life. Here's my life. Take me, use me for your glory. That's your prayer. You make that confession with your mouth to the Lord. If that's your prayer today. Maybe there's one here today that, that you've confessed Jesus as Lord, but, but perhaps your life hasn't been a, a living testimony. And what an encouragement today 
in the midst of all that we've gone through, you would commit today to be the living testimony for the Lord Jesus. Is that your commitment today? Between you and the Lord? Between you and the Lord, is that your commitment today? Here's my life. Jesus, use me. Give me the strength. Give me the courage. Give me the words to say. Give me the peace. Here's my life. Use me. As we sing this song, I want to encourage you. Man, if there's someone here today that you've walked in with something heavy on you, you're going through a difficult set of circumstances and and you just need to know that you're not alone. There's going to be men and women at the different corners of this room. If you're online, there's a host. Man, we would love to pray with you. I don't know what your decision is today. I don't know what your next step needs to be today, but, but that's a starting place. If you surrendered your life over to Jesus today for salvation, when we start singing this song, would you have the courage to step out of your seat and come and tell somebody? Let us celebrate with you. Men with men, ladies with ladies. Maybe your next step is to baptism. Whatever that next step is, would you have the courage from the Lord to take it today? Don't delay. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for how good and faithful you are to us. How good and faithful you have been to us. You will be to us. And we just simply say to you, be all the glory. Lord, change us move right here right now in our midst move Lord Jesus and help us to respond with action so we trust you we ask this in the name above all names in the name of Jesus we pray amen would you stand to your feet and would you move as the spirit of God leads you to move today what is your decision will you trust him